Welcome everybody um, and thank you very much for coming to this uh, very special uh, event, uh, uh, the, the, the second of our Tortoise Reading Clubs and we're absolutely thrilled to have as our guest um, Pete Pafides, the author of this wonderful book Broken Greek, a story of chip shops and pop songs um, and if you haven't read it I thoroughly recommend it to you and uh, who better than Pete to um, explain it to you. Uh, which is what we'll do today, and you'll have a chance to ask, ask some questions. Now, just a bit of housekeeping at the top. Um, obviously, this is a, a, a digital sort of event rather than the, the, the normal in real life events that we, we have at our Fitzrovia headquarters. So it's on Zoom, and if you're not too familiar with Zoom, um, a few things you need to know. You're automatically muted um, when you come in, um, but when I see that you have your hand up, uh, I can come to you uh, because I know that indicates that I know you, you have a question for Pete. And um, uh, the way to do that is you'll see, uh, if you look on the panel, that you have a, a button with raise hand. If you click that, I'll be able to see the, the raise hand function. So if you want to do that now, just to show me that you've got it, that'd be very helpful. So everybody raise their hands just to show us that, not in, in real life, um, raise a hand on the, on the Zoom panel and I'll be able to use that as a means of seeing whether you are interested in joining in, which I very much hope you will. Now, um, Pete, as you may know, is uh, one of the best music journalists around, in, for my money, one of the best journalists period around. And this book, which is his first, is a fascinating, uh, chronicle of the relationship between pop and growing up but it's also just a fantastic memoir so if you're interested in pop music it's fantastic but if you're interested in writing it's also fantastic um, so it, it, let's sort of start Pete by asking you the sort of basic question which is what inspired you to write the book because it's I've got a lot to do, as the title implies, I think, with your heritage, your yeah. Cypriot heritage. And can you tell us a little bit about your family background and how you, you, your family came to be here? And sure, yeah, yeah. Um, my, well, so my parents, uh, my mum's Greek and my dad's Greek Cypriot, and they met in the early 60s um, when my mum moved over from Greece to Cyprus to try and get work and they entered a sort of courtship and it became clear very quickly that you know maybe they could you know get married or whatever and um, the thing that a lot of people were doing at that time and not just in Cyprus but you know in all countries all over the world was you know there were some you know there were generally held to be a lot of um, employment prospects in the UK so they were just two people who thought that if they moved to the UK, got married over there, and and sort of laid down roots um, in order to sort of go back and start a family. My dad really wanted to run a garage. He was very good with cars. He was a very skilled mechanic, and so he thought he'd do his apprenticeship in. They ended up in Birmingham, and um, but things didn't quite go the way they planned. It was quite harder than he thought to get on an apprenticeship, and one thing led to another wasn't really as easy as they were led to believe to make sort of money and they ended up running a chip shop that's the long and short of it as a lot of Cypriots did in the 60s and 70s and um, so and I came along in 1969 and um, when I was uh, when I was four when I just turned four we went on this long summer kind of break in Cyprus um, it was a very idyllic summer and it was a recce really to sort of get ready to move back there because they'd had 10 years in this country and it, they were in a situation they weren't happy about they they didn't doing fish and chips is a hard job you're you know you're working all hours and you get up and prepare the fish and all the rest of it and um and so they um they, so this was a sort of recce we had an amazing summer in cyprus and we we all thought we were going to move there but then the turkish invasion of cyprus happened the island was partitioned and it suddenly was dangerous to bring up kids there. And this sort of threw me into some of my earliest memories that really sort of formed very clearly in the period around that holiday and immediately afterwards. I, I started infant school very late 
and I was rather discombobulated. Um, I stopped talking for three years yes, to, any, to anyone apart from my parents and my brother and my teachers sometimes. It's a, it's a kind of early um, ICBM in, in the book is that you, you were an elective mute, you know, person that chose to stop talking for quite yeah. a while. Um, yeah. do you, do you, tell us about that and what, what you think caused it and how you got out of it. Um, I think it was probably, I think there was a sort of, um, it, the, it was a bit of a shock to be suddenly back in the UK and to be starting a new school surrounded by p people I didn't know very late. Um, I had a lisp which I was very self-conscious about and that was kind of part, that was in the mix as well. And um, and so a strange thing happened really, I, it sort of hastened feelings that I couldn't really would wouldn't have been able to put express at all articulately at the time but it what I now remember as being feelings of guilt about um sort of not turning I was felt myself to becoming English you know I felt like if we were going to stay here then then this was what I was becoming and obviously because it caused my parents, especially my mum, it upset her quite a lot that I just suddenly stopped talking. It was, I felt like I was a kind of, it caused quite a lot of embarrassment in certain social situations. In Cypriot circles, I think, um, you know, there's a lot of, there's a certain amount of point scoring, I would say, in extended families, in kind of, especially in Cypriot extended families, whereas if something strange and freakish is happening in one family, there's a certain amount of schadenfreude <laughs> expressed in other branches of the family. And, um, and as a child, I think you pick up on strange atmospheres around you. I really think that's true of all children. And, uh, and so a lot of what I processed was, guilt and I started talking again at the age of seven a lot of people tried to get me to start talking again teachers my parents but the only person who had any success was my brother Aki who's four years older than me and he um there was there was a bit of a heavy scene at home my mother sort of slightly kind of lost her rag she was very stressed anyway because she was having to kind of bring us up but also working full-time in the chip shop and uh, and she sort of left the room in tears and my brother stepped in and said, look, you know, it doesn't have to be a big thing. Why don't you just go around the corner? There was a boy, Marcus, who lived around the corner. Why don't you just go around to his house and call for him and, um, and just say if his dad answers, Marcus' mother had just recently died. So say if his dad answers, just say, is Marcus there? And you don't have to think about anything else and you don't have to go to school tomorrow and talk again. You never have to talk to strangers again just and if you knock on the door and you don't want to do it that's fine as well and he made it seem like a little thing i've been to, i've been taken to specialists and all sorts you know to uh, to try and sort of work out what the problem was but the only person who sort of made it seem like a manageable thing was my brother so i did it and the that phobia sort of evaporated fairly quickly so you go from being you know sound having played that role in your life to music being slowly progressively much the most important sort of driving force of yeah. change in life and i think one of the things that i'm a very similar vintage to you and so it, it's quite hard to explain to people younger people today how um how difficult it was to get music in mm -hmm. the 70s in the sense that you know now now all basically all music is available on your phone through spotify yeah uh, yeah, I once tried to explain to my kids um, what uh, uh, there's something called dialer disc that plays quite an important part in the early section of the book, because dialer disc was a service run by British Telecom. Amazing as this may seem to younger people, which uh, if you opened up the telephone directory and saw a list of the basic essential services like operator, uh, emergencies, um, weather, talking clock one of the services offered was something called dial -a disc and you call this three digit number and um and you'd sort of ask um you wouldn't necessarily would ask you'd, you'd you'd just you there would be a record playing on the other end of the line a record in the top 10 you wouldn't get to choose the record it was just the record that was playing that day and people we used to do this <laughs> and um 
that was you know so that gives you an indication of how much less ubiquitous pop music was at the time and you know i this was a huge treat for me sometimes my mum would give me like a little fistful of two pence pieces and i'd get to, to the telephone box near the house and you know i was like you know relative to how 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 tall i am now you know that i'll stand back but the the slot the, the coin slot in the phone box was kind of up there so i'd have to sort of really push those two pence pieces in because there was like a little metal bar that you had to push it through and even that in itself was a sort of a feat of strength that's how it felt like at the time and that's what you would do you know it's amazing that this existed god i explained it to my kids once they thought i'd gone they thought i was 500 years old <laughs> and of course you, you you didn't know what you were going to get um what are you gonna get? why would you call a line to hear a record that you don't even get to choose the record so, so what did this, what what did this this portal lead you to? Um, I well, guess we discussed the brother demand at some point. It led me to I think the ones that were, the Rubettes were you know to to listen to the Rubettes Sugar Baby Love in a telephone box. You know that's if you think the intro to Sugar Baby Love is so dramatic anyway. Um, you know it couldn't it couldn't be any more startling if someone had just kind of set a match to the telephone box and it turned into a rocket and you went whizzing up to the moon i was just like that's how it sounds to me now you know and um and you know th the great thing about dial disc was that it, it provided you with a completely context-free source of music and um so you could listen to something like, like i love to love by tina charles or uh, young hearts run free by candy staten and you would instinctively make up kind of backstories to the, but you didn't know what these people looked like. You didn't know what, uh, you know, what their names were. So you'd kind of like, you'd sort of be ma ascribe entire lives to these people that might not necessarily be true. Um, and, you know, you, you uh, nursed fabulously strong opinions quite quickly about people. Um, Jim, we, 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 we talked about this before, but I think, you know, we have to discuss Jimmy Osmond and his mm, yeah well i had phobias i had a lot of people and things that i was scared of and and jimmy osmond you know the osmond for people again who don't remember the osmond family were were terrifyingly ubiquitous in the um in the 1970s they're on television all the time you know they appeared to be sporing at an, at an exponential rate there were so many of them just as you thought you'd seen all of the osmonds other ones would appear and um so you know um I'm, I'm trying not to go t to a contemporary analogy lest it be distasteful but um but anyway um yeah so they were sort of all over the place and um and i was so uh, whenever i saw I, I remember what it was about him little jimmy osmond was not too many years older than me and he seemed like a sort of personification of the kind of child that i was failing at being i was this kind of mute freakish long-haired slightly timorous thing and uh, so every time I saw Jimmy Osmond, it, he was like a direct threat to me. And so I'd hide behind the sofa and cry, which obviously was the only uh, rational reaction a child like me could have to Jimmy Osmond. Have you forgiven him? He's, it, <laughs> have I forgiven him? We, we talked about it earlier on, that it was when I'm a celebrity, uh, wasn't he, recently. Um, I can remember what I was scared of, but I think I've forgiven him. I'm quite a forgiving person these days. Yeah. No, I want to come if I may to Chris Chadwick, who had his hand up um, and ha was, was um, uh, there's Chris with his Alpine, Chris. distinctive Al Alpine background. Hi, Chris. Um, I think you, you were going to um, uh, ask a question possibly connected to the Jackson 5. No, no, I wasn't. <laughs> My hand was up because I'd left it up from when you ah, said. Ah, right, okay. <laughs> but I was in Jackson Five. I remember that little, um, um, you know, jingle. They had a little um, jingle for, with the Jackson Five in it. And I, I remember at the time you were either into the Osmonds or you were into the Jackson Five. Yeah. Did yeah. the Jackson Five um, cross your your sort of? Um, uh, your, your, your vista beat at that stage? I, I... Uh, no, not the Jackson. I've got very, very dim, very dim memories of, 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 of them just being on television once in a while, but I didn't, I don't, I didn't, wouldn't really been able to name them. My earliest memories of the Jackson 5 
of, of, of any Jacksons would have been uh, Michael Jackson doing, uh, oh no, the Jacksons doing uh, uh, Blame It on the Boogie, which is what that exciting video where they left a sort of trail of silhouettes of, of their kind of bodies as they kind of moved around. That was very good. And of course, I mean, you know, if we go on to a, um, if I get around to writing a sequel to this book, uh, Michael Jackson will obviously be a very prominent character because, you know, around about the time of um, of Thriller, he was, people forget this, but, you know, for someone of my age who would have been about 13, he was very alpha. You know, he was the kind of personification of the kind of young guy you wanted to turn into. You wanted to, you know, you might kind of go, get dressed up in the kind of like, in a white suit and go to kind of sophisticated night spots and you'd be a great dancer just like Michael was. You know, we had we had no, I mean, no one had any indication of what was coming down the pipes. He was the most alpha person you could aspire to be, you know. Um, so, um, but no, was it Chris? Were you, uh, who, did, who, who did you prefer? Did you fall on one side or the other? In terms of um, the Jackson 5 or the Osmond? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I, I was, I mean, I remember, for example, just I remember seeing um, the thriller video for the first time and people stopped in the streets yeah. I, I was walking through uh, Manchester I think it was and and they were playing it on the TVs that were in the, the shop windows and people just stopped and yeah. looked at that video and for the because it was I think it was one of the very first um, uh, videos musical videos well, it was John Landis directed it. John Landis, who did American Werewolf in London. And so his stock was at its highest. And, uh, you know, it was, you'd have to spend, I mean, you know, obviously you'd have to, it, they made it available to buy as a video cassette. And that was the only thing that was on it. And it was about £25 or something to even own this thing. So, you know, in modern terms, what would £25 be, you know, like back in 1983? probably like 50 or something i don't know so that was how innovate how relatively unavailable this stuff was and the kind of clamor to like you say oh, it's a brilliant image standing outside radio rentals or rumbelows to cop a, cop a look at <laughs> you know a bit of the video to thriller you know you know as important as the football results which is the other thing that um that people used to stand outside radio rentals for so that really well, yeah, put, I, I can't speak from personal memory but had I gone out to WH Smith's in Catford and bought that VHS cassette I think you'd have found that it had the making of as well as the video so it was you would hope so yes. really good value I, I, I gather um, you're from Catford are you that's brilliant yes yes absolutely like, uh, the, Smurf, like the Smurfs in the Baron Knight song no, I mean, there's, a, there's a connection there uh, my colleague Tessa Murray has a hand up and I know she's a big fan of the book Tessa Hi, Matt. How are you? Hi, how are you? I'm all right, lovely. Pete, I, honestly, I'm just, I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes just totally fangirling you because oh, I loved every minute of this book. Oh, um, I loved it for so many reasons, mainly because I, I think I messaged you. I grew up not far away. My bus route was through Acox Green School. And I literally could smell Birmingham in the 1970s just oh, coming man. off the pages. It was just brilliant. Um, right, so I'm a bit like you backstage with Billy Joel um, right now. So I'm just <laughs> um, I just, I know we're not supposed to ask questions, um, but I, I was thinking uh, just the sheer volume of music that you kind of refer to. Hmm. Have you just got an incredibly kind of photographic memory for this or did stuff come back to you that you'd forgotten as you began sort of burrow into it? Because I've got a really big recovered memory from that time, which was at my first single, hmm. was Up the Junction by Squeeze. Yeah. It really wasn't. It was actually Christmas in Smurfland, but I totally blocked that memory because <laughs> I really wanted it to be Up the Junction. <laughs> Yeah, well, we, 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 I think we all have the record we want it to be, and then we yeah. all have to have the record that it is. But, um, yeah, um, I, I, I didn't feel like I had an exceptional memory, but since the book has come out, people tell me that I do. Um, I thought it was that some of the music I most look forward to writing about in the book was the deeply uncool music that I, that I loved in the first 10 years of my life. You know, as a music journalist, that was a real, um, that was a lot of fun because, you know, I think any music journalist will tell you that the, the phone call you get from a commissioning editor saying, 
we're doing a Beatles special. You got, you know, because your heart sinks because you you sort of think, what could I possibly have to say about the Beatles that hasn't been said already? But the the charmed position I found myself in uh, was that I I was fa I was face I gave myself the job of deconstructing uh, "Save Your Kisses for Me" by the Brotherhood of Man, uh, and the job I set myself was to try and. Now, I'm not saying I succeeded, I don't know if I succeeded, but what the job I set myself was, was, you know, your task today is to make people care as much about this song as, you know, Greil Marcus set out to make people care about Like a Rolling Stone. And so that it gets to the point where, like, you're reading it and you say, hang on, how long does this go on for? This is a... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe I should just listen to it again. You know, now that now that I've read what he's got to say to it, maybe if he, you know, if, if this mattered to him as much as Starman mattered to people who were ten years older than him, that, and maybe you might just listen to something in a song like that. Where you think, oh blimey, actually, that is quite, um, yeah, that is quite moving. <laughs> I must go and lie down. So uh, yeah, no, I, d I sort of did remember all these. So you know, I was quite anal about the charts, about the top forty. So I really did make it my business to hear all this stuff. Also, it's very easy for me because I didn't have many friends. So, <laughs> so that, that freed up a lot of time. <laughs> but, I tell you, anyone who can make me listen to Judy Zook again is a, is a fine man. Oh, bless you. Thank you very much. I loved, you know, it was, I loved, it was a, it was a safe place for me to return to. Um, or, you know, I really look forward to re-entering, to entering that world whenever I had a moment to work on the book. Um, Safe for the Mel Square anyway. <laughs> Mel Square in Sully Hall for people who don't know. Yes, indeed. Yeah, it was uh, where lots of terrible things, the, the abuse of the municipal fountain in Mel Square, which uh, makes it very hard to root for me towards the end of the book for people who haven't read it. Well, well I have changed from putting a tube of fairy liquid into it. So um, <laughs> on the last day of school. We that, that's a great idea we weren't that imaginative <laughs> but, um, right yeah. sorry anyway mustn't hog you thank you tessa thank you very much and i like i like your room your, your room the proportions of your room look like you look like you're inside a gift box it's lovely thank you on the question of pop and its relationship to you know, a memoir and, and an identity. I think one of the things that struck me in the book is that pop music is, or was supposed to be this fantastically ephemeral thing hmm. that lasted for five minutes and then, you know, disappeared like a bubble. Yeah. And the weird thing about pop music as a genre, which its originators, I don't think expected, is that the best of it has become permanent. Hmm. And even the worst of it can be, permanent if it happens to mean a lot to us yeah yeah and and i think that's i mean can you can you say a bit about the, the the role that these things have played in in your memory and your and your you know growing up not just at the time but they they're obviously the signpost by which you 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 know they're the soundtrack of your life yeah. the two things i'd say about that first of all i think you know you've touched on a really a paradox that sits at the very heart of what we love about pop music and it's a sort of almost an insoluble paradox i don't really know why this should be but like you say the really ephemeral stuff the stuff that is kind of just really almost cynically written at times to try and service a need that exists at that moment in time seems to be the stuff that lasts longest and you know there's lots of very clever people in the past going back from Barry Gordy and Phil Spector and Stock Aitken and Waterman uh, you know many many people have have uh, seem to have had an understanding of that and um, and that's the stuff that seems to be the stuff that um, we do sort of it's it's ephemerality some it seems to be part and parcel of what makes it so timeless by contrast you know a lot of the stuff that you know we thought we outgrew in order to kind of get into sort of more heavy serious stuff is the stuff that seems to be anchored to that place in time not always in a very good way and um, so if you kind of thought you'd outgrown Motown and in order to get into the Groundhogs or Hatfield and the North then I'm really not sure that you know you made that a very good decision you know it's um, that, <laughs> that, that you know there's sort of um, 
they're sort of rooted in that time and place. Whereas if, you know, like I can hear, you know, like from my daughter's bedroom, I can hear things like, you know, be my baby kind of chiming out of there or, you know, or sort of um, an early Pet Shop Boys record. And that they sort of seem to that's the t stand that test of time. I don't think they're particularly meant to. Now with the, um, in terms of your point about the soundtrack, um, I, one, one of the key things, one of the fundamental things I wanted to do with the book at the very beginning was the kind of high, the, the, the sort of premise of it was um, that um, the mu and I say, I think it's on the back of the book, you know, the music that you, the reason you love, the music you're, you, that you do love is that it's kind of explaining your situation to you and that's why you love it. And so I really wanted to, now when I used to, before I wrote the book, when I used to sort of say that to, you know, people like you, you might be at a dinner party or something, people say, what's your book about? And, you know, I'm terrible. I'm the worst pitcher in the world. That's one of the reasons why I wrote the book in its entirety, because I knew that if I pitched this idea, I'd be, it would be, it would be awful. It'd be the most embarrassing pitch of, ever, you know, because there's a bit about my parents. And then there's this bit about this theory I've got about how the music you love is explaining your life to you and identity. It's all over the place, really. I just thought, I'm just going to have to buy, I'm just going to have to write this because I can sort of see how it all interlocks in my mind i just can't explain it to people without it sounding crap and so um so the but it was and i remember i used to uh, you know you kind of make small talk with people at parties or I, 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 I said what's your book about i said well it's about how the music you love is kind of explaining your life to you and they'd be like oh yeah, yeah. And, but uh, but it is uh, and hopefully if people have read the book now that they'll see that that's uh, that's kind of where I'm getting at. And that's why ABBA, ABBA are very important, sort of, they're like the Greek chorus to this story in a way, ABBA, because ABBA were the, ABBA were the kind of the band that kind of explained the tensions in my parents' marriage to me. They were, they explained um, what happens to people when they sort of grow up and love becomes something that they have to work at rather than something that is a sort of Disney thing. And, um, they released songs like Money, 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 which really seemed to be a, a total reflection of the, the kind of quandary that my dad found himself in running this chip shop that he didn't even want to run because that was, you know, he was in this kind of economic bind. That was what he had to do. And so, um, yeah, so that it music was totally, sometimes in a very literal way. The first week I started secondary school was the week that Baggy Trousers by Madness came out. I mean, that's like an instructional song. It's a sort of, you could play that to, you know, you could say, what's secondary school like? And you could just play them that record. And that was pretty much, you know, we, we were up and running. Job done. Yeah, you know. So um, I'm keen to talk about ABBA a bit more and, and, and also keen to hear from, from, from others um, uh, at, the, at the meeting about what, you know, they think about ABBA because it's, it's impossible to talk about the period of, that's covered by the book without dealing with ABBA. And... As you say, there was, there was, they, they, they were curiously diffident when they appeared on television, they, they, as if it, this was something they, were, they had to do contractually, but weren't really, um, yeah. you know, into. Um, and uh, you, talk about, you talk about this in the book quite a bit, and, and the, the, the particular impact of different songs, um, like Mamma Mia and Money, 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 and so on. Uh, what, what was they, what do you think was their importance then and now, um, their importance then. Um, to, I mean, they're important uh, in, a, in a very basic way to me. They, they, they sort of they they were kind of they were they ticked a lot of boxes. Actually, you know, I I had this kind of irrational sort of feeling that you know, if I if I con continued to sort of screw up at being the archetypally uh, uh, the archetypal Greek offspring, then my parents might want to just return me to whatever shop they bought me from. And at that point, I'd really need to sort of pitch to have, you know, a, a replacement set of parents that, you know, that, that, might, that might welcome me with open arms. So kind of, ab so I had this kind of mental list and, you know, like Olivia Newton-John was on there and Kiki D was on there. Lindsay DePaul was on there. And Abba Elton, John. Elton John was an imposter, yes? Is that... 
Yeah, so I because because my first exposure to Elton John was with uh, with Kiki D. I thought he was a sort of unwelcome interloper in her song, and I thought it just kind of entrenched my adoration of Kiki D that she was charitable enough to let him sing on her song because he just seemed like a bit of a bit of a creep to me but she was just like a play school presenter in her dungarees and her lovely shiny red hair and so I would have happily kind of you know we've got a do- we've got a dog here a cockapoo called Luna who will just go off with anyone she you know she goes up to people in the park and if they were just to kidnap her she you know, she she wants kind of we had we were burgled earlier on this year and she sort of came down to greet the burglars she was delighted <laughs> we had burglars. and so I was I was a bit like that with people like Kiki D and the Living John. If they just walked into the house and said, "Come with me indefinitely," then I, I would like bye bye. And um, so, so anyway, back to Abba. So Abba served that kind of purpose, and uh, but also they, they were, they were fascinating to me because, as you say, they were, um, there were things that they were, they were mysterious in unexpected ways. When Benny and Bjorn were on Swap Shop, they they seemed so phlegmatic and dry and the music they made was so emotional overwhelming i mean you know they appeared on swap shop to promote knowing me knowing you which you know depicts separation as as just a total devastation which is of course how how parental separation seems to you as well as a as a seven or eight year old but they were just sitting there like these kind of they just kind of come out of a sort of of a, a delegation from a sort of Swedish kind of plastics company and they were just sort of vi- they were visiting some kind of expo to sort of try and work out exactly how many orders of some kind of chair molding they needed to order for the final quarter of the year um, but that, that actually made me like them more because I just thought why are they like why are they like that but why is their music so emotional and then I sort of felt like I got, got to know them over time. I mean, that, that was a great thing about ABBA. They really did let you kind of get to know them in a way. Um, so that, you know, the winner takes it all, like totally intertwined with things that were happening in our house at that time. And then, uh, and then this end game, this bizarre end game with like their final singles, things like The Visitors and The Day Before You Came, which really sort of depicted them in this kind of, glacial sort of emotional cold war that they didn't quite know how what they were how they were going to extricate themselves from so it was a real preview of you know make it actually made adulthood very scary almost every record i listened to made adulthood very scary though i'd like to come to harry Wynn williams now stand up harry are you there yeah hi there hello everyone um i just had a question about um pete you wrote so um sympathetically and uh, forgivingly about both your parents and about these, you know, the, the choices they made and just the fact they had so little idea of what they were getting into and, and how life was a real struggle for them. And then by the end of the book, you, you were really willing for them to dismiss up because they were, you know, quite alienated from each other. Yeah. I just wondered, as much as you feel comfortable to say, what, you know, what happened to them after, after all of this? How, how did they end up? Did they stay in the UK? Did they split up? Um, and did life get any easier, I hope? Miraculously, they're still together, believe it or not. And, wow. uh, and, you know, so that's, you know, that's something that, you know, might be explored possibly in future, uh, future books. I think um, one thing that I, I, was, I had occasion to dwell on in, in writing the book, uh, I sort of ended up doing quite a bit of extraneous research about how, how marriage and expectations of marriage have changed over the years. And I think we have you know we have a slightly our expe- expectations of a happy marriage are, are, are being raised considerably and i think for the better by and large over the years uh i say for the better because we 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 try we try and contrive a situation whereby if if you say you marry if you find the person you you got that you want to marry at the age of say 27 then you at least have a hope you're at least trying to contrive a situation so where you you might still feel like you know, you're very much married to that person and the kind of feelings of excitement that you had for them at the age of 27. You might have at 47 or 57. You might, they might not be there all the time, but they might, they're there a lot of the time, hopefully. And, you know, unlike a tree, the roots of that kind of love grow deeper. And so you also feel emotions 
that bond you to that person that might not also might not be there they're augmented by other emotions so that's you know we we can analyze the emotions that we have going into marriage and we can keep analyze the, analyzing them as our relationship changes um what i noticed reading about marriage in my parents in the era of my parents courtship and much before that a long long time before that is that just culture the cultural expectations of what it is to be married were more bound up in in duty and expedience and um and people it's not like people didn't know that when they entered they, these relationships they they kind of it was a kind of pragmatic decision because you might not meet too many people in your life anyway and so you had to sort of weigh up the pros and cons of kind of leaping in now or waiting until waiting until later so i think for a lot of people in my parents generation culturally i don't think they were necessarily expecting to be head over heels in love with each other sort of 40 years down the pipes what is quite sad and i couldn't really avoid talking about it because it's kind of it's the truth and you have to be honest is that the um for people like my father analyzing their own emotions and adapting to situations that make emotional demands of them was not always very easy especially when they were away from their extended family so i think po probably one of the scenes that your question is referring to is a uh, is a scene where my mum was taken into hospital and uh, my dad didn't really know how to conceal the, the sort of fear and panic that he felt at having to run a chip shop on his own and that was very upsetting to her in that um, situation and I, re I was very angry at the time about what happened but I, I, do, I do sort of realize it, over the time I've realized that what I saw there was a fear reaction not an antipathy reaction not a not a not a callous reaction I, I wish I wish that men didn't like react like that at the time in those situations but that's 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 what men were like and hopefully less men are like that now sorry that's a bit of a rambly answer does that answer your question as i say i'm i'm very impressed that they they are still together and i just hope that their lives are, are more comfortable and a bit more relaxed these days because as you say not only did they make a sort of a very fleeting kind of um decision to marry in the first place but then they put themselves beyond all the support networks that yeah. normally would kind of carry them through it a bit yeah um, and I, thank you thanks for noticing and i i know i know that i i who, whose marriage would 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 survive for that long under the under that sort of pressure so um you know hats off to them and uh but and you know their their, their response to the book has been really touching as well so good. anyway th thank you harry thank you very much Pete, just on that follow up to that, really, which is that um, one that there's a kind of B plot to the musical story, which is your parents' music, which yeah. comes up from time to time. And in particular, and I hope I get this, I pronounce this correctly, a uh, singer called, is it Nikos Siluris? Is that correct? Yeah, Nikos Siluris. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, I actually went on Spotify and listened to some of his stuff, and it's bloody good. And um, you make you 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 suggest uh, he was a very uh, he was quite a radical uh, singer in you know uh, in, in in the politics of the time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Didn't much you then, but you you kind of hint that he's come to mean a lot more to you now. And I, and yeah. I identify with that because my parents, I grew up with the, them playing country music and Joan Baez, which of course I you know didn't listen like at all and now at 52 I listen to country music and Joan Baez and I just wonder if you have you kind of um embraced that oh yeah yeah I I, I listen to it a lot you know um I don't necessarily want to kind of uh it's quite heavy music a lot of Greek folk music and certainly the singer that you mentioned Nikos Xiluris it's quite almost um very passionate it is passionate. It's almost sort of, uh, it has a kind of very spiritual elemental feeling about it at times. And so it's not necessarily what everyone in my house wants to hear on a Sunday morning. And I'm very wary of replicating the heavy atmosphere of Sunday mornings in the house where I grew up, in the house <laughs> where I, the house where I live now. Um, but I listen to it on, you know, on my, you know, in headphones a lot. And, um, uh, yeah no it's beautiful and it, because and the reason i i'm i don't know about you maybe hopefully you can tell me in a second but the reason it's um 
I think I can really enjoy in this way. Well, obviously nostalgic reasons, it, but but it it's not um, it it doesn't represent something. You know, I've resolved that kind of conflict of identity, what it kind of represented. Um, um, that's kind of gone. It kind of can't get me in a way that I thought it might get me um, uh, at the age of eight or nine or whatever. I think part of it is that when you when you have children you go through a kind of velvet revolution with your parents and everything suddenly makes sense. And music was a part of that for me. Um, there's some very interesting uh, chat on, on the chat line about the, um, about the dominance of Swedish writers in, um, in pop, pop music writing out. Richard Rackham. Um, I don't know, Richard, if you'd like to uh, join in. You've made some very interesting points on the chat. Can we, can we go to Richard if he's willing to? Yeah, to... I'm here. Hi. Hi, Richard. Uh, can, Hi. You, can you can you uh, illuminate this very interesting um, point about the dominance of, of Swedish songwriters? Well, fr from my perspective, um, I think certainly over the past 10, 20 years, there have been a number of pop songs. And when I, I, I'm someone that collects music, it's lots of records behind me. But I, Could you uh, uh, speak up a bit? We're, we're, we're sorry, losing you. Sorry. Um, I, I've, I've found when I've looked into a lot of pop music and a lot of the classic pop songs, there always seems to be a bit of a back history uh, uh, with Sweden, with uh, generally Swedish people who are uh, um, responsible for it. And I'm not just talking about things like uh, Licker Lee or Robin, who are um, popular artists at the moment. Um, we've got people like... Uh, um, uh, Max Martin, who wrote things like um, "Baby One More Time" uh, and uh, other uh, other pop songs from NSYNC and Backstreet Boys at the time, which were popular. So yeah. there seems to be like a a bit of a um, a back history, and a, lo and a lot of pop songs. I would say are those disposable pop songs are uh, you know seem to originate from Sweden. Yeah, I'm, I was lucky enough to meet. Um... Benny and Björn, I was lucky enough to interview the guys from ABBA and uh, and it was just around the time, it was about three years after Britney Spears broke big and uh, but you also had, as you say, you had Max Martin was giving a lot of songs to other artists so I think he'd given a Bye 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 to the Backstreet Boys, was it? Was it the Backstreet Boys? Uh, and um, and um, they were, um, I think uh, Britney's, a lot of Britney's singles were written and demoed, I think, at Polar Studios, which were ABBA's studios. And uh, I know Benny and Bjorn very much saw Max Martin as someone who had clearly studied and processed a lot of their songwriting techniques, a lot of the kind of harmonic structure of ABBA songs they felt was very um, recognisable in, um, in, in those early Britney, you know, Baby One More Time and Oops, I Did It Again. Um, they said, you know, they quite understandably and rightly, they took a lot of pride in uh, the fact that what you were, what, what America had kind of was, was buying up at the time in huge quantities and indeed all over the world was Swedish pop music fronted by an American singer. And uh, it was just, um, it is amazing really, isn't it? Because it's a sort of, because those records sound European and, uh, and it sort of shows that, um, the world you know the world was happy to receive them you know they, they didn't need to be kind of americanized uh so yeah no it's um do you do you like a lot do you listen to a lot of that stuff yourself richard um i don't i, I listen to a lot of stuff like robin and licker lee mike snow um i'm not really i wouldn't say i'm a big uh britney spears fan or anything like that um okay. but um they, they certainly are songs that are uh, uh i would say uh popular um and uh, the earworms so you obviously get them in your brain now and again i would recommend i mean i love licky lee and robin and um you're absolutely right but um i would also recommend uh if you've not heard britney spears 2007 album i think blackout that's an incredible piece of work. And I think there are some Swedish producers, producer writers and that that's a really weird kind of conceptual sort of album about the kind of madness. That was her 
uh, Annus Mirabilis, and um, that that was uh, that was an album that kind of funneled a lot of the madness of that year into this incredible state of the art pop album. But anyway, enough for concept that. album. Um, who who knew? Uh, I would like to come to uh, Dave, my colleague Dave Taylor, who um, <laughs> knows so much about music, it's not even funny. Dave. <laughs> Um, and yes, apologies, I'm just in the kitchen making dinner. Um, um, Pete, we crossed over very briefly at the Times and I remember um, it was a proud moment for me when we bonded over um, our mutual love for a Sasha remix of M People. So um, <laughs> that was, as I remember it, it was the first time a news desk had ever discussed Sasha with you, remixes or otherwise. I, it, it was a pro oh my god, someone... Stay there a second. Someone's oh, sorry. Someone there's someone at the door. Um, uh, but I think someone's getting it. Um, yeah, no. But was, as you know, it was very um, it was very unusual to uh, find anyone at the time, certainly at the news desk, that could bond over a Sasha remix of an M People track. So um, if I didn't say very much, it was probably that I was stunned. I was terrified of the news desk because <laughs> they, they that was like a place where all the proper journalists were. So yeah. on those nights when I had to file on the night reviews, um. I, it was just talking, talking to people on the news desk was sort of terrifying to me. And literally, I think maybe the most scared I've ever been in my life. I can't think of a time I've been more scared is when I, when, when I was dispatched to review the Led Zeppelin uh, wow. re reunion concert at the O2. And I just knew that this was a, a something that you just could not screw up. If you screwed up, then you would just, you may as well just, you know, Keith Blackmore would have um, would have been totting over your copy, I'm sure. Just leave um, the O2 and keep walking <laughs> and never come back again anywhere. Yeah. I do, know. I do, I do remember that um, the, the the worst offender in that way was the person who um, who 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 uh, covered the opening ceremony of the Olympics for uh, the Times and who was pretty pissy about it in the first edition and scrambled <laughs> to say it was the greatest moment. In on, that, was, was that, 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 that was Giles Curran, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Have I seen <laughs> it? Oh, yeah. Yes, it yeah. was. Um, well, so I'm, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna fess up to early singles, including um, "Mamma Mia" and "Billy Don't Be a Hero," but um, I very definitely went off "Brotherhood of Man" when I realised that they were not in Forest supporters when they um, went on top of the pops with a massive rosette on, um, just at the time when they were playing Newcastle in the FA Cup. Um, but um, I was just wondering, um, what happens in your household during lockdown? And are you um, having dance parties with your kids? And is there anything you bond over? My, my two daughters, who are 16 and 19, they, I, they've had little mini dance parties with each other in the garden. They've got their, you know, the, um, the, the uh, Bluetooth speaker uh, with their computers or whatever. And they have like little kind of cathartic, kind of emotional off offloading dance parties in the garden. Um, I don't think anyone would really want to sort of dance to my selections. I mean, I, I, I sort of DJ from time to time, uh, street parties or whatever, and they come along to those. And, you know, my selections are, um, you know, I, yeah, d disco and funk and some indie. I mean, we do, into my, my, uh, they do like my selections, but I don't think they'd want to really sort of dance to them. But, um, yeah, it's, it's been, our lockdown's been okay so far. I mean, you know, it's, it's, I'm very aware, well aware that it could, could have been a lot worse. But I think part of that is we seem to be operating a shift system now. And our, da our daughters are up all night and we just kind of cross paths, um, you know, briefly, you know, so in the afternoon. And then, um, and then that's kind of that. So we're sort of, sort of passing strangers in a weird way. Hey, there's, there's a great question on the, the chat from, uh, hmm. A real stalwart of our um, of our thinking, to member Nicholas Stanhope, who asks, "Pete, what will you play at your daughter's weddings?" Great question. What will they let me play at my daughter's weddings? I mean, they it's moderated just... question. <laughs> <laughs> um, what would you like to play at their weddings? What would I like to play? Well, um, my okay. Well, it's a two part answer, I guess. Really, Could we sort of our youngest one is sixteen, and she's. She's really in the throes of a very, very intense music. So she plays music, she writes songs, she records songs, and um, she, she plays piano and guitar. She's in a band, and um, you know she had, you know, she had an epiphany really at the age of around eleven, I think, where I, one summer's evening she was kind of bored and there was nothing on telly, and 
we um i felt like this was a good time to put on the beatles anthology documentary dvds and i thought you know as far as i'm concerned the story of the beatles is the greatest story ever told bar none everything you could wish for from a story um friendship love you know betrayal um, you know anything you want for is in the beatles story and uh and so um so we kind of sat down and she watched she watched it both of them watched it the oldest one said that was great but i'm probably out for the remainder the youngest one watched it and she turned around and she said can we watch the second one and when the second one finished she said can we watch the third one and um and so the found, found, the founding myth of her relationship with music is the Beatles. Um, but she's sort of gone on to, you know, late, lately it's kind of all about f female punk bands like The Slits and The Raincoats and Riot Girl and Sonic Youth and all, all that stuff. So that's sort of where she's at. So there are points of intersection that, that we make, and that's fantastic. And then with the oldest one, it's all about very carefully curated playlists. And we have this tradition every month. I can't do it at the moment because of lockdown. <clears throat> but we have a tradition every month where every, on the third Thursday of each month, we, we get in the car and we make a collaborative playlist. I do 10 songs and she does 10 songs. And, uh, and we call it Thrusday because our, our, our aim is to get to a drive through restaurant and we get there and we don't know where we're going to go. It's just a random drive. through So it's usually McDonald's because that's the only drive throughs you get over here. And we sit in the car park and we talk about what we sort of listen to whilst eating our junk food. And then we listen to the remainder of songs when we come, come back. And that's, um, so we've kind of been intersected in all sorts of ways. We have, sort of like, you know, a lot of, they kind of indie and funk and sort of, you know, a bit of hip hop, sorry. That's a bit vague, but there you go. Uh, just in, in, the, in the unlikely event that, that any of you haven't bought uh, Pete's book yet, the, um, my colleague Lisa Mosley has very kindly put the link up to, um, to buy it in the chat. So buy it now. Um, can we come to, uh, I'm, I'm hoping he's there, Keith Blackmore, my, my oh, Keith. esteemed colleague, who, um, as well as being a senior editor at Fortis, owns a record shop in Brighton. Uh, Keith, are you there? Can we, how can we find Keith? I know the very record shop that Ke I think Keith has bought and I keep meaning to go there. Paging Keith Blackmore. Maybe we can come back. Elusive. We'll, 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 we'll get to him uh, in due course, hopefully. Um, sure. I was going to ask you about the Beatles actually um, raised an interesting question with me about from the book, which is that you kind of retro-engineer the Beatles because yeah. you, you come to them, first of all, through, you love Mull of Kintyre by Paul McCartney. You, mm. you kind of get into Wings. And then on, on the day of John Lennon's uh, death, you make a terrible, you know, some serious discoveries. So, so yeah. it's kind of, you come to the Beatles from beginning at the end. Yeah, yeah. I think there was a... Uh... I found a very useful quote from Soren Kierkegaard, which I, I'll probably completely balls up now. But um, I think I, I said that um, I was, I think Kierkegaard said something like, human beings are doomed to live life forwards, but understand it backwards. And, um, and, um, and that was the day I heard I am the walrus for the first time. And in, in listening to it, <clears throat> I realized that that was where the petri disc petri dish in which elo jeff lynn had grown elo and in that moment i think i said i uh, in that moment i was uh, i was living life <laughs> i was living life backwards in order to understand it forwards anyway and um but yeah the day that john lennon died it was a massively important day uh, because as you said that was the day that i really that i sort of discovered the beatles and the um and, you know, it, all sorts of things happened on that day. You know, the, I had a clock radio. You know, those clock radios used to get with the, they were digital, but they weren't electronic digital. They had the little flappy numbers that used to kind of go down and they used to make a noise every time that you, it was a new minute. And the, that, so that turned itself on. And, uh, and it, you know, you immediately thrust into this shocked world. It was uh, the breakfast show. I mean, there were people getting kind of updates about John and John Lennon's death. So I immediately understood that it was really, really important. But for me, John Lennon 
was the guy that did Just Like Starting Over, which was the hit single that he had in the charts. So it was already going down the charts when he was shot, and then suddenly it kind of shot back up again as records want to do when people died. And I love that record. I, love, I still love that record. And I didn't understand why people were bitchy about that record, why people called the, the guy that did it, why people said that this was a soft, sappy, sentimental song. To me, it was like a, 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 a representation of what I wanted love to be when I grew up. Like I wanted to kind of like get married to someone who made me feel the way just like starting over. The, so I really obsessed upon that record. And, uh, and because I was so obsessed with that record, it really upset me that John Lennon died. You know, it, 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 disproportionately so. And I went downstairs, my parents were having uh, breakfast. And I said to them, and I expected them to be as shocked as the people on the radio were. And, uh, but they weren't really, they were, they were kind of, they were surprised, but they had, you know, potatoes to peel, they had fish to slice, you know, all the stuff that you needed to do. And in that moment, you kind of get a little realization, you're a little peek into what really, what's really preoccupying you as an adult in, in that world. But actually, the reaction I wanted to see was the reaction that was happening at the next door neighbor's house. There was a girl that lived next door called Jed, who really sort of took me under her wing and she was like an older sister to me. And I came home from school that day and I went straight to her house. <clears throat> and um, they're an English family. They were very, um, they, they loved the Beatles. The Beatles are very important in their, you know, in their world. And she, she was the person that played me, I am the walrus. And she, there was a biscuit tin near the record player in the front room of their house. And she opened the lid and that was where all their old Beatles singles were kept. And, um, and that was, and I said, you know, she said something about, you know, she was the one that told me that John Lennon had been in a band with Paul McCartney. And I was like, hang on, John, John Lennon and Paul McCartney were in the Beatles together. She said, yes, yes, that was, their, that was their band. And I said, that's amazing. That's, <clears throat> that's such a coincidence. They were in the same band. Because, of course, in that moment, you forget that life goes in one direction. I was kind of like, it was almost like they'd formed a band in that moment in time. I couldn't get over that. And she gave me this record, the uh, compilation, The Beatles, Oldies But Goodies. And I took it home. And it was like just a series of explosions going off in my head because, of course, that was how they meant to sound. That was how they recorded them. And, you know, the genius of those records is that they, that John Lennon and Paul McCartney would build these little sections into them where I think you're almost supposed to scream. So if you listen to I Want to Hold Your Hand, it has that kind of little kind of guitar kind of um, mo um, sort of expression, that motif, those few notes on a guitar that kind of just before they go into the first lines. And I don't, I don't understand why, what the purpose of that is, if not for you to scream in anticipation of what's to come. Yes, it's a call to go crazy, isn't it? It is. They all sound, those first few singles, they all sound like that. It's just amazing. It's still amazing now. Yeah. I, I once met Yoko Ono, and I found it very difficult not to ask her about her role in the breakup of the Beatles. It was an act of great self-restraint that I'm one sure. I managed to get through it. I'm sure she was very grateful to you. I'm sure she noticed. Yeah, it's probably the first time a journalist hadn't asked her that. Um, just finally, Pete, before, before we end, because we're just reaching the end of this, um, you, you, you sort of finished the book at, at, a, at a kind of climactic in your life, and I, I don't want to give it away because if people haven't read it, um, mm. it, it it's, it's, it's a very special and moving way to end the book. Um, are you going to carry the story on? Um, as we hope I don't know um, I, um, I've, 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 I, I, I've kind of I'm, I'm proceeding in, in, in much the same way as I did at the, uh, in the bit leading up to this book where I kind of started to kind of make notes and gather ephemera and, uh, and started to sort of arrange a sequence of anecdotes in my on, in my head and on my computer and on files that might conceivably become um, a book in the end. I think if there's another book, it will it will be it's slightly different in tone in as much as, um, you know, obviously we're dealing with a different time in my life and, and not to put too fine a point on it, there were long periods in my teenage life where I was just an 
absolute buffoon uh and uh just one pratfall after another really and and just you know going up blind alleys that would just and you know go, i you know i kind of went into my slightly pretentious years soon after the book ends i just suddenly i i kind of decided i was just too sensitive to be friends with a lot of the, the, the people, my classmates and so forth and actually the re maybe the reasons why I hadn't really fitted in very much was just because I was I just had too poetic an outlook on life <laughs> so. I, I think I think having sold it like that you, you, you know you have to write it now um very sadly we're drawing to the end of the hour um Thank you, but Matt. um I'm first of all would like to issue an instruction as the prime minister puts it to Pete to write the follow-up, Mended Greek, which is going to be <laughs> better. Um, if you haven't uh, read and bought it, this is re it really is one of my books of the year. This is absolutely oh, Thank fantastic. you so much. And thanks so much to Pete for, for, for coming and uh, sharing um, his the way he put this book together and what it means to him. Uh, the next uh, meeting of the book club will be on April the 30th, Thursday, and we'll be talking about Helen Lewis's excellent book, Difficult Women. Uh, so please make a date in your diary. Come along to that. Book in now. Uh, it's going to be a terrific event. And um, join me in, in some digital fashion in thanking Pete. Um, and thank you for coming. And have a very good evening. Good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.